What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Complete Sinner's Guide. And with us, man, we got a whole host of guests with us tonight. So we'll just go around the table. We'll start off with my co-host, Joshua Davison. Brother, what is going on, man? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. I'm blessed to be here. Uh, I expect this to be uh, a very uh, manageable and slow moving conversation (laughs) with no cut. No, this is going to be very uh, fast paced and probably pretty dense. And I hope people have a notebook and are paying attention. Uh, Don't be afraid to use the pause button and really capture what it is that we're talking about here, because what we're aiming at is clarity. That's right. That's right. We got a good group of people to discuss Reformed theology. We're digging into it tonight to discuss some things that Josh Sherman has got some misconceptions um, that questions that he has about Reformed theology. We're going to answer those. I've got some questions about Reformed theology myself for all those who know me. Um, You know, I'm reformed, you know, I hold to a reformed perspective. And so lately, though, over the past couple of months, I'll say that maybe I've been starting to not necessarily question reformed theology in and of itself, but maybe question some aspects of it. And so we're going to be digging into that, namely with compatibilism, determinism, how those things play effect. Uh, But first, we'll go ahead and introduce Joshua Sherman, the man that really got this conversation started. What is going on, brother man? How you doing? I love the Freudian slip of saying that I have some misconceptions. I mean, questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll start right off with that that zinger right back at you. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just uh, it was interesting. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of the the non Calvinists and residents on 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 CSG. Uh, I'm on here a lot and, and just asking questions and trying to learn stuff. And and uh, we go back and forth. And um, but yeah, I mean, it's just I I. I I saw some things, especially looking at the the debate that uh, James White and William Lane Craig had on Unbelievable, that just raised some questions for me about how much clarity the clarity there is sometimes in people's minds when they're watching things like that and trying to put categories in their head and say, "Oh, what is he saying? Oh, what is he saying? Can I make any sense of this at all? Are they being consistent?" Um, and so Tyler and I started talking about that. And uh, it just kind of led to some some further questions, and he pointed me at some things, and so here we are, kind of you know just kind of dig into it. And um, obviously, you know, I don't feel like I'm going to be driving the entire conversation. We have six people here, um, but maybe starting off with some of those things that kind of came up for me, and then just kind of going from there, and letting you guys lay it out. Okay, well, it looks like Tyler somehow dropped out just now. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive him for that in advance. Um, but our, our he, next did, he didn't like what I had to say. The, uh, the, the, the Calvinist brothers who are going to be informing us tonight of what it is that they, they believe and how they, let's say, uh, have connection with one another and where they have their individual nuances and how that all plays out. Uh, and maybe we can sort through some of this. So Chris Date, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us, man. And I really appreciate it. Uh, how are you doing? You're muted, bud. Muted. Yep. I didn't. I didn't mute myself. One go. of you guys must have done it. Sorry. Yeah, I'm doing <laughs> well. Um, uh, I'm a little nervous that with this many faces, I'll have to speak about half as long as I normally do. Uh, I'll do my <laughs> that's, best. That's probable. Um, you know, but you know, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to curb you from you know, being able to speak your mind, but there's probably going to be some, uh, some, some sharing of headspace here. Cause there's a lot of other, uh, there's a lot of other things going on. And I, this is, this is kind of intimidating for me also, because, uh, being the one that I feel like, uh, Sherman and I are the elephant in the room, uh, trying to, <laughs> trying to take up as little space as possible. And so, um, uh, with that being said, Andrew, how you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. And thank you for joining us, man. Hey, once again, it's good to be with you guys. Um, Really thankful for my, you know, recently fast friendship with Tyler, just being able to put all of this into motion. And for tonight, um, most who know me on social media know me from TikTok. So my TikTok handle is Andrew Does Apologetics. Um, I would say the part of the Lord's Vineyard that I mostly work in is um, not only spreading the gospel on a giant global app that seems to not know what it was, it is by and large, but um, I delve into Reformed theology. I think amongst the group tonight, I'm probably the the baby Calvinist. So um, I always tell my non-Calvinist friends who I was alongside of theologically a year ago, hey, um, I'm very confident where I am now, but if someone were to ever give me something exegetically and not emotional against Calvinism, you know, I'm obviously going wherever the truth goes. 
But, you know, through TikTok and through learning uh, not only better theology to defend the faith with, I've met some great people along the way, like the Black Doctor. He's actually, <laughs> we would say he's the leader, the leading reformed voice on TikTok. And um, if, if he's the dog of reformed theology, like I'm the tick on his back, right? So I, I feel like <laughs> amongst amazing. everyone, I'm just that honorary mentioned person who would normally be in the audience, but I get to be alongside you all tonight. I'll probably contribute the least in terms of uh, knowledge, but anything that I feel like Chris and Jeremiah leave behind, or if I want to um, reiterate something in a different fashion, I'll be sure to chime in on. But Overall, just glad to be here tonight, and I'm glad that amongst the differences we have on a secondary issue, that um, our unity in the gospel and our unity with Christ is represented, not that we all see eye to eye on everything, but that unity is stronger and more beautiful amidst the contrasting differences that we have. So just happy to be here, and that's all I got. I like, I, I like the fact Andrew. that... I, I, I like the fact that everybody, as soon as you said the unity in Christ, everybody gave a unanimous head nod <laughs> of agreement. So thanks, everybody, for participating in that. That was beautiful. If y'all think, <laughs> think we're heretics, now is the time to say something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, okay, uh, David Russell's not on the line. No. At least maybe for some other reason. <laughs> oh, but. my goodness. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so, so last but not least, Jeremiah, the Black Doctor. Nice to meet you, buddy. Uh, again, uh, welcome to the show, and I appreciate your involvement and interaction. Uh, that's a very unique title, being the premier voice on TikTok. Uh, I have recently, having downloaded this app, I still have no idea what it is on my <laughs> phone, so that CSG can participate. I, uh, I have to say, it's kind of an interesting experience this like flash photography version of information uh i really don't know what to make of it yet uh so tell, tell me uh, welcome it. to the show and uh welcome to the long format <laughs> oh, well of course thank you thank you very much for having me on uh, of course andrew thank you for the the glowing compliments you are too much <laughs> and, and and chris don't don't worry about it um all of us on tiktok know how to how to take how to take a ton of information and bring it down to about a minute long. So um, again, thank you guys for uh, letting me be here. I've been doing apologetics for about seven years, been a Calvinist for six years, and um, hopefully the discussion that we have will be edifying to everyone. Uh, even if we disagree, we unite on the essentials, and Amen. those things are what keep us together. That's where the Amen. gospel is. Amen. Yeah, and I, I I agree with that. You know, what's cool is um, Tyler, uh, with, who is back now. Um, I, I became friends with him, uh, when I was recently coming out of my Calvinism and exploring more, uh, aspects of, of, of theologies that I had never encountered because I was in a headspace where I was only listening to my favorite hero teachers and just, that was my framework was my favorite hero teachers. I'd never really investigated for myself. And I found myself with a bunch of uh, let's, you know, like with Greg Coco language stones in my shoe, you know, that I couldn't like ignore anymore. So I had to start investigating things and I found myself, uh, quickly disassembling what it is that I had received. And so, um, after that time, when I was in my, let's say, uh, the, the non-Calvinist cage stage or whatever that correspondence would be, um, <laughs> and Calvin and, and Tyler, oddly enough, was in his Calvinist st cage stage somehow him and I became best friends, <laughs> so random, and through that point have have knocked off so many loose edges off of each other that I think that this is going to be a really copacetic uh, kind of headspace right now. So, Brother, only predestination could explain that, okay? So that, that's, that's the only <laughs> yeah, 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 like a, intervention. It's like a Wesley yeah. versus Whitfield thing. Hey, there you go. There you <laughs> sort go. of, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, Josh, I appreciate it, man. And yes, absolutely. I'm excited to get this conversation going. So let's just go ahead and get started off. Sherman, you had some questions. Me and you have been kind of dialoguing back and forth off of air, you know, in our private time. And just so go ahead and kind of give people a background of what we have been discussing. And then yeah. just pose your questions, man. And we'll go around no particular order. Just whoever wants to jump in, uh, feel free and we'll go from there. So I think what really kicked it off for me, like I was saying, is is listening to the <clears throat> debate that James White and William Lane Craig had. And there was a point when they were talking about Genesis 50, particularly, where I felt like James White was laying out a pretty solid critique of 
the the Molinist position with that passage. And some of the language that he used, I felt like fit better into frameworks that I've generally understood as non-Calvinist. So I, I just kind of had that moment of going, okay, I need to clarify some things here. I need to explore this more. So I started talking with Tyler about it. And um, and uh, he pointed me to uh, Randy Alcorn's book, Hand in Hand, uh, where he essentially kind of lays out um, different views on providence and free will. Uh, particularly in chapter five, he talks about uh, ascent different views specifically on that particular issue and gets into compatibilism especially and lays out determinism and, and Arminianism and free will and kind of stuff as well. Um, and so I came across this quote and I was just kind of listening to it and, and I went back and I'm on audible. I went back and listened like five or six times and I was like, I don't think I've ever heard someone that says they're a Calvinist say that before. So then I had that question of like, okay, I think that maybe a lot of what we're seeing when people say you don't understand Calvinism really is people not understanding just how much variety there is within Calvinism. And then thinking they're talking to someone over here when they're actually talking to someone over here and, and just kind of being completely discombobulated. <laughs> and, and that happens, I think, a lot in these kinds of discussions because people tend to have a better frame of reference for the worldview they're in. Uh, and have a hard time getting out of that to put themselves in the place of another worldview to understand, is it consistent within itself? And then how does it, it interact with other things? Uh, and so I think what I wanted to do is just start with this quote from Randy Alcorn and kind of get your sense on, does this sound like what you think of when you think of compatibilism, when you think of Calvinism? We can talk a little bit more about some of the key terms and, and, and uh, that people talk about with with each different kind of, of Calvinism and maybe just kind of lay out some of those things. So maybe we get an idea that I'm going to guess that probably you don't all have exactly the same viewpoint and the same definitions and that's okay. It actually helps to know that variety a little bit in order to understand this. Uh, so uh, what, what Randy Alcorn wrote was, was this um, compatibilists believe God is free to overrule creatures choices but is also free to choose not to whenever he can accomplish his sovereign plan through their freely made choices, right or wrong. And my question to you is, does that sound like compatibilism to you? <laughs> Chris shaking his head. <laughs> what you got, brother? Well, I'll, I'll explain myself, but I just <clears throat> want to say I fully intended to wait and not speak until my fellow Calvinist guests here had a chance to speak. So just for the record, you're the one who asked me what I think. Oh. I wasn't the one who just leapt to That's grab right. the microphone first. That's right. Well, so first of all, it is true that there are some Calvinists who think that God determines some things but does not predetermine others. Greg Kokel, I think, is an example who thinks, who self identifies as a Calvinist, believes that God predetermines some things but not all. Um, and it sounds like that's kind of what Alcorn is getting at there. But I would say I that's so. likely. What's that? I think so. Yeah. I would say, however, that that's likely a minority of people who knowledgeably self-identify as compatibilists. Right. Compatibilism, just for your audience's sake, uh, and for your sake, if, it, if, if, if this is new information, compatibilism is short for compatibilistic free will. And it's just the idea that um, determinism is compatible with moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that are compatible in compatibilism. So I actually, so right off the bat, I find it kind of strange that Alcorn would identify compatibilism as the view that God overrules some people's choices, but in other cases, uh, lets them make their choices freely, because mm. the whole point of compatibilism is to affirm determinism. Right. Full stop. <laughs> okay. But a determinism right. that is compatible with moral responsibility. Yeah. So no... I don't think that, so I, I would not say that. What I would say, what's more, and no compatibilist is going to say that God overrules people's choice sometimes. Um, we would say, or at least I, I would say as a compatibilist, and I think most compatibilists would sign on this dotted line, that people choose, we all choose, but what we choose has been predetermined by God from eternity past. Um, it's not about him overruling our choice. It's him predetermining our choice. 
Now, I, at some point in the discussion, I want to get to this idea of so-called causal determinism. Mm -hmm. Many times in that conversation between Drs. White and Craig, Craig accused compatibilists of believing that God moves people to choose one way or the other. Yes. <clears throat> and I reject that. Not, however, not all compatibilists will reject that. So I'll table that for later in the discussion. But no, just in short, I don't think that Alcorn's description there really fits most of us compatibilists. Jeremiah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you look like you were nodding in agreement with Chris. Are you are are you uh, mm -hmm. in in the same kind of uh, boat as he is right now? Yeah, I would I would wholeheartedly agree with Chris. Compatibilism to me is is just the proposition that that human free will and God's predestination, God's decree, are compatible with one another. They don't um, automatically cancel out. Um, other mm -hmm. other theories, sort of like um, you know Arminianism or even Molinism, they seem to presuppose indeterminism. And okay. so I would I would say that the the reform position. And especially the Calvinist position is that they are compatible. And the question mm -hmm. is, what kind of free will are we talking about? And how mm -hmm. does God determine? Well, Chris said and, specifically moral responsibility. So exactly. by free will, you mean moral responsibility? Is that yes. it, so those are the same thing for you then? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, Jeremiah, so, maybe it would be better to say the kind they have a sufficient degree of freedom as to be held morally responsible. Yes, yes. Yeah. They can do okay. actions that are that are either praiseworthy or blameworthy. Okay. <laughs> they they so they they certainly will do some certain action because it is determined. They yes, they because... will do some actions that are praiseworthy and blameworthy and therefore because it's a reality that's built it needs to be corresponding to a judgment. So they have moral culpability for the things that they themselves are doing, right? Correct. Am correct. I following? Yes. Okay. I, I want to clarify something real quick. Andrew, I want your thoughts on it. Um, decree. Jeremiah said God's decree. Now, whenever you guys t are talking about God's <laughs> decree, are we talking about something that just, I know people have different opinions on this, but I'm just going to say it because that's what we're all, or that's what I'm familiar with. In eternity past, right? Whenever, before God created, he had all of this planned out. What would, what I clarify as what would happen, right? What will happen that was planned out in God's mind before he created. Is that what we're talking about whenever we're talking about decree? Yes. And okay. so where we contrast from an Arminian or I, I don't want to just broad brush all the non-Calvinist groups as Arminian. Um, that's something a newbie Calvinist does and i'm trying to yeah. detach from that um so let's just say those who take the prescient view of foreknowledge and predestination and even molinists so um what we're saying is that in the prescient view while god's just conveniently aware of what is going to happen even though he's not the sole first ultimate cause of that or in molinism mm -hmm. that god to the superlative over prescience he's now got um, a matrix of all feasible universes that he has to actualize based on his choice, um, we actually would just tie the knot, I think, the most consistently. And in that decree, in order for him to bring about things freely, and this is something that James White kept bringing up, the Eutychia, if God's delimited to choose amongst something that he just knows, but he didn't cause, or multiple um, infinite realities that he's not the sole determining cause of, then how can he do it to the good pleasure and graces of his own will? We would just say as compatibilists that he is that ultimate first cause. And I agree with Chris and Jeremiah that he is not moving people. Mm -hmm. So if, if I have it in my heart as a depraved sinner to go rob a bank, God's not like pulling me up by the arm and drag me into my car to go rob that bank. He knows that I, in my depraved nature, I'll act according to that nature. And even though in time I'm acting freely to do that thing, he's predetermined that all so that it's not caught off guard and everything, even down to the most finite detail. And as R.C. Sproul would say, even the, um, the tiniest mo molecule where there can't be a maverick molecule, all of it is ultimately predetermined by God. So this is a lot more than just a mere foreknowledge of the events that will happen. This is an actual working in and with those events, like per se. Because the thing is, and this is the grounding objection, right? If, if you, if God's just aware conveniently, but he didn't mm -hmm. cause, how does he know that? And what other eternal force independent of him is eternally relaying that information to him? That's 
where I think um, I didn't like William Lane Craig's answer to that at all. It's like, well, that's that's not necessary to answer. Or I think at even one point towards the end of the debate, he said that um, there is no origin to evil in humans actions. It just kind of is. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we would see a problem in their view. Well, I, I mean, in, it necessarily the 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 way that the the situation would go, it wouldn't necessarily be God working in and with something in time the same way that we would, obviously. So I, I saw Chris's reaction when when you yeah. said that. Um, I think what he was going to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, that it would be something like God prearranged everything, and we are now acting it out in time in in exact correspondence to God's prearrangement. Is that is that the yeah, idea? Rather than close. God necessarily interacting with it on the spur of the moment in time, it is prearranged in, yes. in the way that God uh, saw fit to, to do so, yeah? I think that's close. And, and the one thing I want to emphasize is that, and this isn't going to be true of all compatibilists, but it's true of me. I don't necessarily think that, that the way things take place in space time in accordance with what god has planned is because god sort of set up the initial conditions of the big bang and then there's just an unbroken chain of physical cause and effect from the moment of the big bang all the way to the point where they hit us now like kind i don't of like think a he has theistic to... deism right like the clock right maker. i'm not yeah. right exactly so here's what i would like for more calvinist to think i would like more calvinist to think like me uh and, and i think they should think <laughs> i think they should think of the relationship between god's decree and what takes place in space and time as analogous to the relationship between the author of a story and the events that take place in the story so Here's an analogy. Imagine for, for the sake of argument that when an author conceives of a story in his mind or her mind, um, that world becomes a real world, all right, in which everything that takes place is exactly what the author conceived of. So let's say that J.R.R. Tolkien conceives of the world of Middle Earth, everything that happens from the past stuff that's recorded in the Silmaril Silmarillion all the way through The Hobbit and then through The Lord of the Rings. Right. Um, at the moment that Sam and Frodo are, reach Mount Doom and Sam is pleading with Frodo to throw the ring into the fire to destroy it, for those of you who know the story, Frodo refuses. And thankfully, Gollum appears and rips the, the, the ring away from him and then falls into the fire with it and prays, you know, thankfully the ring gets destroyed that way. But here's, here's the, the key thing I want to get at. At the moment, if this world that Tolkien conceived of became real by virtue of him conceiving of it, which and his conception of it is what I'm making analogous to God's decree. If that happens, at the moment that Frodo is, is faced with the decision to throw that ring into Mount Doom, Tolkien's not doing anything. Tolkien, Tolkien isn't um, at that moment writing the story. He's not at that moment moving Frodo's will. And for that matter, this doesn't commit one to thinking that Frodo's decision is just the latest effect in an unbroken physical chain of cause and effect stretching back to the Big Bang of Middle Earth. You don't have to do any of that. There's just some sort of mysterious uh, relationship between the decree of Tolkien and the choice of Frodo to throw the ring into the fire in a way that's analogous to the mysterious way in which God's decree that I would do X or Y guarantees that in time I will do X or Y. It's, it's an infallible decree it will guarantee it will absolutely happen but god doesn't have to actively cause anything to happen um and i think that is a way to avoid the charge that in our view god is the author of evil so is that in a way chris how god can allow things to happen as well well but i'm i'm one of those weird calvinists who really resists the language of permission okay. because right. this is something i wanted to talk about because people yeah, have yeah. different views here Right. Because because in that it go back to my analogy, Tolkien doesn't allow any of the characters in Middle Earth to do what they do. He decrees everything they do. There is nothing that takes place other than what he says they will do. And so I'm I'm not of the belief that God permits creatures to do things. I think he decrees it all. Every every single bit of it. But I just don't think he has to I don't think he's actively causing it. Sometimes he writes himself into the story, so to speak, right? Some he he, he influences like for example 
example, he um, parts the Red Sea, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes he is active in the story, but I'm just saying he doesn't need to be active in the story for what he decrees to yeah. obtain. Kind of like a restraining Abimelech's sin uh, with Abraham or Abraham's wife. He wrote himself into that, whereas he necessarily didn't have to, to restrain that per se. That's right. Gotcha. Uh, real quick, and then we'll go back to Sherman because we kind of hijacked the conversation. And then we got a, a question from Blake. Uh, but Andrew and Jeremiah, I want to get your thoughts. Do you guys, uh, what do y'all think about the permission language? Y'all for it? Not so much. What, what do you guys think? It, for for me, it really does depend on the context. Some reformed, and I believe even Calvin, Calvin himself sometimes uses the language of permission, but we have to frame it within a particular contrast. You mm -hmm. use permission in contrast to you know action. For example, active and passive. God has his his active decree in which he actively moves and participates in providence, and then his passive decree, as in you know, thing men, uh, particularly in relation to evil, men doing things out of the the sinfulness of their own hearts. God isn't putting a gun to their head saying, "Be evil, be evil." Right. Nor, as the hyper Calvinists would, uh, some of, some hyper Calvinists would imply that God instills evil into the creature, and right. that would actually make God the author of sin. The use of permission is only to say that God has decreed these things to happen, but in His decree he is separate from evil actions. Gotcha. I'm on board with that. I like, yeah, I, I could affirm permission in that sense. So, so the difference, it's not that he's not decreeing it. It's not that he's not preordaining it. It's just that he's not actively causing it or, exactly. or, or, or motivating it. Whereas in some cases, like for example, when he hardens Pharaoh's heart, mm -hmm. he is actively involved in influencing the, 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 the person's will. Got right. It, it, it's it's primarily in the use of or explaining the use of secondary causes. Okay. Fair enough. Andrew, what do you think? Anything else you want to add, brother? Or... Y'all remember when I said I was the baby Calvinist? No, I'm <laughs> um, so what, what jumps out to me um, scripturally, because I do want to stay grounded and, and make sure we're all on board to say that we're sola scriptura. Um, mm. Genesis 50, 20, I think actually perfectly explains men's actions and permission in that sense of um, the execution of second causes, but also Acts chapter four, how Pontius Pilate and Herod and all the Gentiles came against God's holy service servant Jesus to do whatever his hand and his plan had predestined to do. There's, and that's, that encompasses, I think the core and the heart of compatibilism. And um, what I also thought is R.C. Sproul's quote, God's free. I'm free. When my freedom runs into God's freedom, I lose. Hmm. So there's that. Well, I don't have a disagreement with that quote from Sproul at all, or or the the quote from the scripture. So I don't think that those necessarily draw <clears throat> the distinctions that we're looking yeah. for in that way. But I mm -hmm. I appreciate the way that you applied that. That makes sense after what's being described here. Why you would bring that up. Um, but can I can I ask you because it seems like there's a unanimous agreement here, and I know that Tyler has some distinctions personally uh, from some of the things that you guys described, at least in some of the conclusions that we've come to in, in the conversations in the past. And so to kind of draw this out, you guys are saying like unanimously that this is uh, uh, like in, like the the foundation of understanding the Calvinistic framework is that God ultimately authored all things that will be like with without exception it's full full determinism with the with the disclosure that because we're experiential agents that we are morally culpable for what we do is that that's is that a good recap of where everybody's at here or am, I'm I'm not trying to like pull all the nuances back out but kind of right. nobody disagrees with that so far right I, I, I would be a little careful. I would say, yes, it sounds like we all believe in what is sometimes called exhaustive divine providence, uh, exhaustive determinism. God predetermines everything that takes place in time. But I think the reason why we're saying that people are still held morally accountable is because at the moment of choice, nothing is forcing their hand. They're not, right. God isn't grabbing their wrist and moving their hand to sin, or he's mm -hmm. not, he, he didn't trigger the big bang that sets off a line of dominoes that eventually culminates in a person sinning. No, people sin by their own choice, but what they choose was perfectly and exhaustively predetermined by God. 
right? right. And so it's not necessarily materialism that's responsible for uh, that because I think that's what you're saying is that you're not a materialist. You're uh, you believe in God, <laughs> and so I think that we, by like thinking about it as a material causal chain, as though there weren't any like person there. I, I agree with you that that makes perfect sense to make that distinction. So I wasn't trying to say that we don't like have the experience of being persons, right? Um, but but yeah. it is just the experience of having been a person that makes what seems to be a moral decision in 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 reference to what's around it rather than what's behind it, right? Because you guys are talking about what's behind the thing rather than necessarily what's around the person as far as influences and things like that. You guys are talking about what's behind reality as the thing that lets, uh, as, your, as your analogy said, authored it, right? And so it's kind of like a different thing. We're not talking about necessarily the immediate influences of the choice. Like you said, it's not a gun to the head. It's necessarily the person in that circumstance making this decision. But the decision corresponds to that which is behind the decision, the authorship, right? Or, or the decree to use. Yeah. Decree. Yeah. Sure, yeah. decree. Yeah. Okay, so and, rather than authorship, I'll use the word decree. That's why I'm trying to be I'm trying to be specific to the language we've defined so that we can all follow each other. Right. Yeah. And, cool. If I if if I could probably add a add a little bit more of a kink into this because us reform love making distinctions, <laughs> um, I, I would I would personally distinguish between the subjects that we're talking about, especially when we get into the biblical scriptures. Uh, we right now we're speaking of God's decree, God's uh, predestination, sort of so to speak, and then when we get into the biblical scriptures or narratives in relation to how God interacts with time, we should use the term providence because that is how God actually interacts with time and, and, and interacts with his people. Right now we're talking about God's decree and how he is the, he is the ultimate cause of all things, even the actions of men. And then as we go into the biblical narratives, we will see God actually interacting with, uh, with his people. That's how in our experience, we see God quote unquote, changing his mind, us influencing his actions and things like that. Because as you were saying, Chris, right now we're talking about the, the author as he thinks about his story and as he begins to write his story. But as we get into providence, we see how he, as the author actually goes into the story and interacts with his characters. So if we can if we can talk about the, that interaction a little bit, I, I think it'd be interesting because this is another place where I think maybe people get confused when we start talking about compatibilism, is that there are different views of kind of how that works behind the scenes. Uh, and one of those is, is that kind of Edwardian view, right? That essentially people uh, will pursue their greatest desire and that what God does is he essentially is like, well, the, the greatest desire you have now isn't going to accomplish my plan. I'm going to make you have a different desire. And then your will is free to choose what you really want. But what you want is what I made you desire. Um, and I could be mischaracterizing that. So the, the look on Chris, Chris's face makes me think I probably am. Um, but um, I want to, I guess when I, when I think about like God moving or God doing something within time, interacting with people, um, however that works, I want to talk about that a little bit more and just kind of see, like, how do you see that fitting together? Chris, how did I mischaracterize Jonathan Edwards uh, so that we can maybe uh, be clear about this instead of having a, a, a caricature that I'm, I'm playing off of as a script? I'm not an expert on Edwards. And if okay. Jeremiah or Andrew knows Edwards better than I do, then they can come in here. But I suspect it's a mistake to say that what Edwards thinks is that God actively changes people's will to guarantee that they make a certain choice. I not not that, will, I, desire. Fine, but still, he, I don't think he's stepping into time and changing people, his desi people's desire in order to guarantee an outcome. I think what, the, the, what Edwards probably was saying is consistent with what we've been saying and the concept of secondary causes. The, 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 the means by which God guarantees that in his story some agent does something is by predetermining that that agent 
is born and is raised and has experiences that result that shape him in such a way as to have a greatest desire and that greatest desire is what the agent pursues when he does some certain action so i don't think edwards is saying that hmm. he's going in there and changing people's desire it's just he predetermines what people's desires will be so that what they choose is exactly what he wants them to choose because it's consistent with their greatest desire that sounds right. a whole lot like Molinism in a way to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, in, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I think really the, the distinction between Calvinism and Molinism really goes all the way back into, you know, how God obtains his foreknowledge, how God mm -hmm. actualizes worlds, things like that, the, the rounding objection. But the, the way that you described God changing natures or the changing the desires of one's heart the only way that i believe that that would actually work and if i'm if i'm thinking because i've 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 seen this argument from edwards come around in some circles i mm -hmm. think the only way that that would be relevant is in relation to you know subjects like regeneration the changing the heart of stone into a heart of flesh where mm -hmm. then our 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 desires our nature to sin has been changed so we we begin to you know we begin to hate our sin we begin to start loving christ our hearts finally start beating for him and we start going to walk in his way and fight against the flesh i think only in that context yeah that description God, makes sense yeah in other words god isn't merely decreeing that people become saved he is actively causing them to be regenerated so that they will choose christ right right, um, right. but he's not actively uh, all the time anyway actively changing people's desires so that they will sin hmm. so because uh, sometimes he appears to have done it with pharaoh for example right and, and that was right. actually the, the the thing i wanted to bring up is it sounds like there may be another example where that does happen in scripture when we're talking about god actively hardening people's hearts mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Um, so that seems like another place where God is doing something with the heart, something inside, right? And um, and that's one of the things that I, th I think gets super interesting that maybe sometimes gets kind of walked over when people are going back and forth about like, you know, well, did, did God harden Pharaoh's heart because God started and Pharaoh did? And then like, which one was first and what matters and all that? Like, it's like to me, what I think is interesting is that it specifically says they both did in, in different circumstances. So you have God hardening Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardening his heart. For some reason, the way that the narrative of Scripture is written, we're supposed to understand something from the fact that Pharaoh was involved in this too, but also God was actively doing something. Mm -hmm. And and this is where uh, one of the other questions that I kind of had was um, when we had the episode a, a few weeks ago with Bishop James Long, uh, at the very end of it, we got a little bit into Calvinism and free will, and, and he's an exorcist. And so he, he deals a lot with kind of these the sense of people that have truly lost all will um, because they've been ruled, they're being ruled by uh, the spirit. Uh, right. Um, and he just kind of doesn't agree at all with Calvinism. And it was, and took a very much a sense of like, God never overrules free will. Mm. It's, it's, it was, it's almost an absolute. And I was talking with, with Tyler about it and I was just kind of thinking like, but I feel like we see that in scripture. And so like, I'm somewhere on the in-between, but I'm trying to kind of just work this out a little bit more as to the specifics of how that works. So when we're talking about regeneration, it sounds like God is actively doing something or moving. And we're talking about hardening in scripture. It sounds like God is actively moving within somebody. Mm -hmm. Are there any other instances you can think of, or are those basically our two categories? I think of Romans one, but mm -hmm. you could parallel that to hardening. So right. those who did not wish to retain yep. God in their knowledge, he gave him over to a reprobate mind. But I, I don't think the sequence of things as we see happening in time, whether it's regenerating and bringing us to spiritual life or um, sending us a strong delusion like Romans 11 talks about or giving us to that depraved mind as a result of judgment. I don't think those things escape God's ultimate decree at all. I think it's just the well, sequence in which it happens. Yeah. Well, in fact, I would argue that his own actions of regenerating and hardening are themselves parts of his decree. I so agree. going back mm -hmm. to my analogy of Tolkien, if Tolkien were to write himself into his story, the actions that he takes in the story are part of the story he writes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, so you're right. They don't. His actions in time don't escape his decree. They are the product of his decree. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> That one gets kind of interesting too, because and in, in, 
I'm going to say these words, but I'm not trying to be be mean with them. I, it just it brings the, the the concept to mind, and so I want to kind of see where this goes. Is there ever a point where God is essentially a slave to His own decree because He's decreed and now He has to fulfill it? Is that like it? Just I'm guessing that's a wrong way to think about it, but I want to step back from that way of wording it and see right. how you approach that. I, I think the only way that that would happen is if the decree was not based on God's own wise will because God hmm. in and of himself is self-confident in himself. And he does these things for his own glory. What, what does scripture say? For the kind intention of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. So the only way that he would become technically a slave to his own will is hmm. if at one time, he wills something to happen, but then on another time, he 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 says, you know, I've I've made a mistake. I I shouldn't have decreed this. This is this is wrong, and that would imply something. That would imply an imperfection in God, hmm. and therefore God would cease to be God, in my opinion, because God is God is simple. His his actions are are wise, holy, and just. And so if he went back on it that would mean something in his decree was not wise, was not holy and was not just. That's, that's yeah. how I would respond to that. I, I think that makes sense. It's, it's kind of like the same question of saying, you know, could, could God ever sin? Right? right. Is he a slave to his goodness? Like, well, <laughs> I'd rather say he's it's kind he's of a bound. weird way to say it. He's, right? he's the ultimate perfect standard in which he's bound to himself. And so right. for, for God to decree something and then 2000 years into that, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I want to save like three more people like that. Well, that would imply an error in judgment or um, I, I, I would think I'm not accusing you of this, of course, but if that were possible, that means we're thinking of God in almost a, a limited human way right. rather than being someone who's omniscient, eternal, perfectly moral, good being. Right. Right. And what, what does scripture say? That that God is unable to lie. He physically cannot lie. Why? Is it, is it because of an imperfection in him? No, it's because he's good. He's good. He cannot deny himself. His nature is in and of itself good. So why would God even attempt to do something evil? Why would God attempt to deceive? His nature is just. To, can to I, use can a really I... crass analogy... I have the capacity when I see a pile of dog poop on the ground to reach down, pick it up and eat it. But everything in my being screams out against it and I will not do it no matter what. And I think it's God has the capacity arguably to sin, but it would violate every fiber of his being. And so therefore he doesn't do it. Right. right. Can, right. I, can I just jump in for a second and ask, um, yeah. because I... I think that the way that everybody had uh, at least a unanimous agreement with Chris's analogy to Tolkien being the author and Tolkien, let's say, uh, authoring himself into mixed portions of the story uh, to make um, seeming seeming spur the moment interventions, but really they're part of his authorship itself. They're not in contrast or in, in, in interruption of the story. They're literally part of the story. Right. Um, how would you differentiate that from like a role play? Is God is God literally making a story? Is this reality as real as we experience it? Or is this kind of a preliminary to something else that we'll experience with him when we get to heaven and glory? Like I because I'm the way that you described it has my mind going because I have. Uh, a tendency to look at things through a narrative lens uh, <laughs> yeah. in, no. in that way, kind of in general, because yeah. I, I like I'm a storyteller. I like stories. I love to listen to stories. And I feel like we are in a story in which we participate. Um, sure. But that participation, I don't think, is uh, one to one analogous with something of a story like Tolkien's where Frodo or let's say even uh, for the for the sake of what we're discussing now, let's say Sauron right, is in a position to do something other than that which is penned, right? So then in what sense, because Tolkien bears a direct relation to Sauron because Sauron's a fiction. And outside of Tolkien's mind, there is no Sauron until he shares it with some other person. Right, um, but remember, so, 
Remember when I offered the analogy, though, I said, let's say for the sake of argument that by conceiving of a story, Tolkien actually creates the world of Middle Earth. He doesn't. Right. And I wouldn't actually I actually don't think that that has to be an analogy. I think that we actually do create things in our imagination. We just don't have the, okay. that play over reality around us. It exists within ourselves. And so and I'm that's saying exactly... is that's still analogous to the way that God is making this story. It exists within the confines of him, his own self. Yeah, I don't think I would say that. Mm -mm. Okay, um, so then there is something out, but outside of himself that we are we are real, like we exist apart yeah. from God. We're actually a real thing. Yes, but we do exactly what that he writ, what he wrote, uh, exactly what he decreed. And to answer your initial question, I don't, I, I, th I don't, I, th people have a misunderstanding of what our uh, eschatology. They have a misunderstanding of eschatology. The, the Christian hope is not in escaping material creation. It's about, right. it's, it's in hope of being resurrected within material creation and glorified, perfected, made immortal, living for all eternity. So to uh, shape the analogy a little bit more, it's more like Tolkien creates a world that has a beginning and has no end. And we are in that story. We will mm. die at some point in Unless he's decreed that the Lord returns prior to our deaths, um, but we will rise within the story again and be made perfect and immortal and live with Christ for all eternity. It's it's all part of the decree. Eternity future is, in my view, entirely exhaustively decreed. Hmm. Okay, so then then his interaction in the story, let's say, is necessarily something like um, something like. Uh, I, I don't what other like besides role play, what word would you use to, to characterize God's interaction with a story that he pre wrote? He's actually interacting with those actual real agents in the world he creates. It's just that his actions are exactly what he decreed they would be. Mm -hmm. it's almost as if... Go ahead. Well, uh, Chris, I would, I, I would ask, is it just as just as saying not only did he create the story but he also places himself as one of the characters in it mm -hmm. and yep. so when he enters into the story he becomes one of the characters i mean it's just like in the incarnation he 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 acts as one of us he becomes one of us well but you need to make a distinction between what god does as himself in the story and what God does as the incarnate son in the story. Very true. So right. for example, when Jesus is being baptized, that's simultaneously God's action in, um, in the, uh, in the person of Christ, mm -hmm. the incarnate son, and it's the Holy Spirit's and father's actions in time outside of the person of Christ. Right. The Holy yeah. Spirit's descending while the father's yeah, actually father making the confession speaks. of the, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like the, the best proof text against uh, modalism, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're all yeah. there. Exactly. Exactly. You would think, but as an ex-modalist, they twist that. Uh, oh, man. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's right. I need to talk to you yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you do. <laughs> the, the one is false. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, okay, so, so then, then uh, again, I, I guess maybe I'm not connecting because it's I, and, I'm, and I'm probably just tired. What, what is the what is the the disconnect between the idea of because you said he actually becomes he actually becomes the character like a good actor will do that. What do you mean? Well, let's say that I said right now, tomorrow, I'm going to go to the grocery store. Yeah. And then tomorrow, guess what I do? I go to the grocery store. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The only difference is that God's <laughs> decree, it, it transcends created space time. Right. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't exist within creation naturally. He exists t transcendently. Whether we affirm a very strong view of divine timelessness and simplicity or not, either way, he transcends created space time and his decree is made from there. But then the world begins because of his decree to create. And at points in time throughout the world, he acts just like in my analogy, I go to the store tomorrow, having said today, I'm going to go to the store. Mm. So would it be a good idea to maybe view God as dimensionally like outside, you know, like you said, he transcends space time. And so maybe <laughs> instead of viewing aware God is, you know, versus outside of the story and inside of the story, what you guys are saying is he transcends the story itself, right? Gotcha. Right. That's right. Josh, does that make sense? Or are you still having that disconnect? 
which Josh? You got Josh squared on here, bro. Well, David <laughs> Davison. So Sherman is Sherman, and you're you. So <laughs> <laughs> you're you. That's I can right. be me. That's fine. Um, so so okay. So then then I guess in terms of explaining God being the character as though he was, let's say, planning a future event for himself, um, because God necessarily wanted to enter into time. That was part of his decree, obviously. Uh, it was to enter into time to be a participant in the story that he had authored. Um, so then I guess, because I know that this is going to be part of the questions uh, that, that come up in the Q&A, because uh, I've been I've been kind of poking around in there. Uh, so I, I, I know that this is going to tie in. So I kind of want to get a preemptive like gun on, on, on the question. How is there a moral disconnect between God's authorship of everything that will be? And yet he is not the, quote, author of the sin that will be, even though he authored it with like, where is the gap that needs to be? Like, I know where the gap needs to be established, but how do you create the gap between God's authorship and the actual moral culpability of any given thing that he did author? And that, I, that doesn't, ne I'm not aiming that at anyone. So I anybody know. feel free to jump in there. I was just being quiet to give, I've been talking a lot. So I wanted to give Jeremiah and Andrew a chance to answer, but I do have an answer. I'll, I'll just let them speak first if they wish. Mm -hmm. Andrew, go ahead, brother. You've Andrew, would you quiet. like to go first? No, I'd actually like to get Jeremiah's thoughts first, humbly. Oh, well, gee, thanks. <laughs> no pressure, brother. <laughs> yeah, no no well, pressure well, at all, bro. You're just answering well, for the eternal decree. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, first and foremost, I would do just as the Reformed have and distinguish between God's God's ultimate cause and then secondary causes. The ultimate, the the distinction then is, is of course, because God is the author, he is the one who declares everything but uh, again he's not the one doing everything he is the one who writes in the wills the free wills and free choices of those secondary causes that's why he that's why he can rightly say to adam you know where are you he he's he's calling adam out from understanding um to understand his sin and he he rightly holds Adam and Eve accountable. He he rightly pleads with people, saying, "I hold my hand out to a to a stubborn and obstinate people," even though he's the one who has in his decree that these people are stubborn, that these people are fallen, and yet he still reaches out to them because they are truly free. They are true secondary causes, and so he's not the one causing them to sin. He's not the one instilling sin in them. He knows what they've done. He's declared what they've done, but he's not the one actively doing it. So okay. that's why I wanted yeah. to get Jeremiah's thoughts first is um, mm -hmm. I know this might be a swear word in the reform community now, but a uh, long while back, a few months back, I was watching a video by Doug Wilson. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but in his reform basics, um, if we're speaking analogously, I actually like his analogy between the playwright and the character in the play, like Shakespeare and the person playing Hamlet. Um, but he well, would that would, say, that's what I was getting at when I said role play and I wasn't trying to be no. necessarily disrespectful or anything. That's exactly what I had envisioned was something like that. Like, like, uh, like William Shakespeare writing himself into a play, something, something approximating that. The only thing I was saying to that degree is, um, when Shakespeare writes the person who's playing Hamlet's lines, we ask who is responsible for how well the play went, the author or how passionately the person acting does. Is it the playwright or the character? And the answer is actually both. And where it would actually tie in our space is it God is the Shakespeare, but he's not bound to space and time in our system. He transcends that. Um, but I would also say it like this, too, because someone I saw this in a comment uh, on one of James White's videos. It's the difference between saying, did God personally invent the washing machine no like he didn't come into whenever that happened and said here i am i'm going to invent the washing machine but he did predestine the people the uh, the chain of events you know the things that would lead up to the person having the idea to personally invent the washing machine and that's the distinction between um preceding and predetermining everything that would happen in his so-called narrative or story um versus mm -hmm. actually being involved so just to just to clarify then there is a distinct difference between decree and cause right yes 
guys. Yes. 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 With one exception or with one caveat, which okay. is there is a distinction between ultimate cause or first cause and causes in time. So okay. I'm comfortable saying that God is the ultimate cause of all evil in the sense that he is the first cause of creation, but right. it's not causal in the sense that we normally mean. Um, and so to go back to my analogy of Frodo, um, God has predetermined that Frodo will throw that or will refuse to throw that ring into the fires of Mount Doom. But Frodo is making the choice to do so. There's nothing forcing his hand. Granted, the the ring is exerting some influence, just like drug <laughs> addiction or, you know, um, my own sin nature. A lot of right. things influence my decisions. But mm -hmm. Tolkien isn't forcing Frodo's hand, and neither is God forcing mine. So, right. so this is what's critical. The problem with the author of Sin Objection is that it uses... Um, a word that where they mean cause and we don't. Mm -hmm. We don't mean God is causing people to sin. Yes, he's authored the story in which people sin. He's decreed that they sin. But what makes him not the author of sin is that he's not, in the sense that the objectors mean by that phrase, he's not causing people to sin. He simply decreed that they will. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. So I, I think maybe two things that, that come to mind for me, and, and one is just recognizing that, that really, if we're going to talk about God being the author in the sense of being the ultimate cause because he created, that's something that all Christians share, right? That's not an objection I can just lay at Calvinist feet and say, well, I'm non-Calvinist. I don't have to deal with that. Well, <laughs> like, right? yeah. like we, we all have to have that sense of the fact that God created a world in which evil happens. However, we, we think about that, whether we think that it happens because of free choices that don't have to do with God's decree or whether we think that God decreed them all. We all have to deal with the fact that God created a world in which evil happens. That's just something we share. And, and that's yes, OK. You know, but. Only we determinists shoulder the burden of saying that people's choice to sin um, is logically posterior to God's decree that they do so. Right. So that's, that's true. in fact, I've been saying for some time now that Calvinism or that determinist Calvinism and Molinism, they just swap a certain logical um, order in determinism. God's decree that somebody does something logically precedes that person actually doing it. But in Molinism, the, 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 in the possible world in which somebody does, does something, that is what logically precedes God's decree to create that world. Correct. So it's just, mm -hmm. it's just a flip back and it, it's just a matter of logical priority. And we determinists are the only ones who share the burden of God being the first cause or ultimate cause of sin in that sense. Right. right. What it really boils down to, the ultimate debate, first of all, it's an internal paradox, which I think is what makes this secondary in nature. It's not antithetical to the gospel. But I, I really mm -hmm. feel like my reflection on not just Molinism and determinism, but all of the, uh, the non-reformed trains of thought is one's calling God's goodness into being by being the ultimate first cause of evil, potentially. And the other one would say, if you don't agree with us, now you're calling God's sovereignty into question. So it, it's, I, I, I feel sort, sort of most consistent, but I don't think we as Calvinists own the fact that God's the one who created. We just think it, determinism is the most consistent way to explain that. Well, and I just determinism. Want to... Go ahead, Jeremiah. Sorry. Well, I would say that determinism first and foremost declares God's freedom and then, well, it, it first and foremost declares and safeguards God's freedom. And then we get to the subject of man's freedom because, of course, prolegomena, God comes first, theology proper, God comes first. And then you have anthropology, the free will of man, the, the accountability of man and things of that nature. However, and when it comes to Molinism, I, sort of like what Chris was saying, it, it, it's the opposite. Man's freedom comes first, and then you have to deal with determinism. If if that seems to be the behavior that I see in Molinists, that, that's, so, just, that's just how I see it. So here might be a case where we've stumbled upon a genuine disagreement between me on the one hand and Jeremiah and Andrew on the other, which is totally fine. I'm, I disagree with just about everybody on some <laughs> <laughs> But, but you're the but annihilation. Actually, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, but but this is but but I actually have become convinced that we 
that, that non-Calvinists are not jeopardizing God's freedom. They're not, they're not subjecting his freedom to our will. And the reason is because to a T, every non-Calvinist, every indeterminist, every Molinist, every Arminian, every Alpentheist, every provisionist that I've spoken to has said that it's not that God is unable to predetermine things exhaustively the way that we believe, but that he chooses not to because right. libertarian freedom is a greater good. It, it's, it's just like us saying God mm. won't sin because it's against his nature. Well, in the same way, they would say God won't predetermine exhaustively because that's against his nature. Right. Um, <clears throat> so mm. I actually don't think that, that other views, with the possible exception of open theism, jeopardizes God's freedom, um, I, even I if I do think do... our view is most consistent with scripture. I, I right. think we might get there if we get into people where it's like once God has created and we're in situ that that um, God cannot overrule free will. Right. Some people talk like that. And I think if people are talking like that, then that's where to me it sounds like people are putting a limit on God that I don't think is there. Right. I, I don't think non-Calvinists are going to say that that God hasn't the ability to overrule people's freedom in time. I, I've seen it. I, I, it's I'm not a good. common view. Okay. It's not a representative view. But I, I'm just going to say that, that within the non-Calvinist, as a non-Calvinist, I have seen that happen. I do not agree yeah. with that. <laughs> good. I think that's right. a mistake. If yeah, I were to yeah. become a non-Calvinist. Yeah. I think I would say God chooses freely not to right. overrule the freedom Thank of you. creatures. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Right. Right. Guys, this so is then, been awesome. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, Ty Tyler, it's probably time to to, to jump over yeah. to that Q and A section because we've yeah. really uh, uh, extended for about an hour now. So, well, kind of going through it, we've we've answered like a lot of people's um, uh, questions to begin with, but we'll we'll start with this one from ladies and gentlemen. Isn't God giving a sin nature to people in consequence of the fall? Exactly, Him working evil into their very nature. Well, whoever wants to jump on that one, yeah. One problem with that objection is that he doesn't decree that the fall, or his decree, the carrying out of his decree that the fall happens, that fall is the result first of Adam's and Eve's choice to sin, which, yes, God decreed, but they didn't act from a uh, from the position of having a sinful nature like all of their progeny do. Right. So, so I think what we would say is that the sin nature that is uh, f from the position of which all of us sin since Adam and Eve, um, that is the consequence of Adam's choice to sin. And I would argue that even even our sin nature doesn't um, exhaustively determine our actions. It's just that is the means by which God has decreed humankind universally sins is because we all do inherit this sinful nature. Anyway, right. I'm, I'm rambling. Somebody else can chime in here if they like. <laughs> Well, well, that actually sparked I, I something interesting exactly for right. me personally. I was actually going to ask specifically because this is more for, for, for what you just said, Chris. In in response to that, you said something specifically about how the first thing was Adam and Eve's sin, in correspondence with God's decree, and then they sinned differently than their progeny. What? How in the? How is it? How is it in the in the story? It's the same story. It's the same outworking of the sin. There's no like causal mechanism difference. What's the difference between their sin and ours? Well, but that's just it. In in situ, to use Joshua's phrase, um, Adam and Eve, they choose to sin, which absolutely God decreed, but they chose to sin without being influenced to sin by a sin nature. Whereas all of Adam and Eve's progeny, with the sole exception of the incarnate God-man, um, sins having been influenced to do so by their sin nature but why the extra influence why, why why would that be necessary if it wasn't necessary at first i just don't why see why that would actually come in it doesn't seem like it would be a, a necessary component anymore the story god has chosen to write he's the right. one who's chosen to decree a world in which adam and eve sin freely a whole fully freely and all of their progeny free of uh, sin in part by uh, because of their bondage to their sinful nature that they inherit from their parents Mm -hmm. Right. And might I also bring in, I guess, a bit more of a covenantal aspect. The reason why that the reason why there is a particular a particular effect to all men is because of the, the covenant of works that is given between Adam and God. God has covenanted with Adam and he said, you know, if you 
uh, if you, through your perfect personal obedience, obey God's law, I will bless you. I will take you up into blessedness. But if you disobey, you will die, you and all your posterity. And so he, when, when man sins, God is keeping his covenant promises. He is keeping his covenant promises to his people, him and all of his posterity. And we even see this parallel in the incarnation of Christ. He is our second Adam. He is our federal head as displayed in, in, um, uh, in Romans chapter five. His act of righteousness justifies those who are in him. So if we have an objection against uh, Adam's fall and, and the effect that it has upon us fallen men, we must rightly provide an objection against the one act of Christ and the justification that he brings all of those who are in him. Well, that, I, I wasn't bringing in an objection against the fall necessarily. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, and and I, I, it's it's difficult not to feel like I should be offering my opinion. So forgive me <laughs> well, because I'm me... trying to formulate what I'm thinking into a question rather yeah. than bringing an objection. So when Think I- Think about when it I, this when way. I, Josh Davidson, if I asked yeah. you, well, let me ask you this. Um, are you a young earth, old earth, or theistic evolutionist? Um, I'm a, I couldn't care less about that subject. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. I, let this, Hypothetically this the speaking, one. let's say that you were a young earth creationist like I am. Okay. And imagine if I said to you, why does God have to create in that way? Why couldn't he have created in 6 million years instead of 6,000? Or yeah. why didn't he create through evolution? Why, why, why did he have to create specially? Who, God can do whatever he wants that's consistent with his nature. I don't know why he does some things over others. So the fact that he has chosen to decree the sin of Adam and Eve without a, an influencing sin nature, but his decree of all other people's sins does entail uh, a, a sin nature from the moment that they're conceived. I don't know why that's the story God chose to write, but it's the story that he chose to write. So then can I can I ask specifically what you mean by free when you say freely or freedom? What I mean, nothing mean by is forcing free? their hand. Forcing. Their... So, so well, I mean, what are they free from, though? Like, what is what exactly are they free from? Because it's not like they actually are free to do anything other than that which was authored. I'm like, what what is their freedom attached to? It's not the experience of force. But there's nothing else they could do. They are technically speaking forced to do whatever they're doing. No, because they're not the forced. Authorship. What's forcing them? The authorship. But that they're that still, doesn't exist in is, time. Is is electively created by someone else, and they so? don't really have the first cause, as you said, of of being the selective thing by which that choice or event came about. They're they're playing so, their role in the story. They're not playing That's a role. A They're not simply role playing a script or something like that. They are doing precisely what they want to do, precisely what they choose to do. They're weighing all of the all of the consequences and benefits and all those things. And then they, and they're being influenced by addictions and by uh, external forces and things like that. And then ultimately they make a choice, and God has decreed that. But nothing is forcing their hands. Think of it this way: very often we determinists are accused of thinking that people are just basically like robots or puppets. Well, think about what happens think about a puppet when a puppet moves it's because something is a marionette is pulling a string that string is attached to the arm and the arm moves similarly with a robot the, the a programmer in time programs the execution and then the P cpu carries out the execution and it moves the robot's limbs programmatically it's just it's all direct causation but what we're saying is that when a person chooses to, chooses to sin there is no marionette string tied to their hand causing it to move in a certain way there is no programming that's firing in the world god has created that brings about the action that god has decreed so that's what i mean by free there's literally nothing forcing the agent's hand to do what they nevertheless do exactly as god has decreed so chris the, the decree experience right we're talking oh. about their experience not their will can I take no it is this? their will their will is bound to the decree. Like it isn't free. Like it's, What's it's their will is free to whatever the nature they're under. So we're not it, saying they're free that's, that's autonomously. Like, I'm not talking about their nature. I'm talking about. But if they were free autonomously free, free, then it's possible that they could do something other than what God decreed to do, and then open theism becomes a possibility. Sorry, or that God chose not to decree it, like Chris said. But that's that's different. I'm not. I'm like I said. I'm not trying to bring my own opinion. I'm trying to understand what you're saying as distinct from what I'm hearing. So and because what I'm hearing sounds like a technicality, not like a like anything that amounts to an actual difference in my mind. 
As well, you're you certainly welcome it, to think to that. But what I'm saying is that they act, agents are free because God isn't forcing them to do what they do. They are doing what they do out of their own volition. The decree. M- might, is, I, uh, might I provide? I, 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 I would hope to provide a, a little bit more of a not only just a confessional quote, but a and a a, a quote from a, a scholarly work, the the Reform Systematic Theology by Joel Beakey. Do you think that would help? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Here, this this is what this is what Joel Beakey says when he talks about the relationship between um, God's decree and man's sovereignty and the objection of you know full on causal determinism. He says, Reform theologians teach the divine decree alongside the doctrine of man's free moral agency. Determinism asserts that man's actions are caused by what is in and around him so that he behaves like a machine. Against this idea, Calvin said, quote, we do not with the Stoics contrive a necessity out of the perpetual connection and intimately related series of causes which is contained in nature, end quote. Turretin writes, each person's choices become spontaneously from his heart when he perceives a situation and makes a rational judgment about what is good. In quote, Perkins said, quote, the necessary decree of God does not abolish the nature of second causes and impose necessity upon the will of man, end quote. One creature could necessitate the action of another only by hindering the latter's free agency. However, God the creator does not act on the same level as creatures. He is able to necessitate the creature's actions while upholding those creatures as genuine secondary causes, acting without coercion on their own level. Consequently, Willibius says, quote, the decree of God is not the cause of moral evil, for it determines what takes place, not by a coercive necessity, but merely an immutable one, end quote. God makes no one sin. So, and we see with the fall, we see not only are there factors spontaneously coming from Adam and Eve's will, but we also see the consequences of, you know, uh, uh, Eve's temptation by Satan. Of course, Eve, uh, Satan tries to draw doubt within the heart of Eve. And when Eve looks at the fruit, she sees that it is good for food and she wants to desire it. And so she takes and then she and then she gives it to her husband and her husband who is with her does not question anything but wills takes from his wife and eats the fruit mm-hmm. so we see free choices there we see what they want to do and it is not forced upon them by anything mm-hmm. so because de- so because god decreed something that does not necessitate force coercion or anything of uh, like that right because right, something is decreed part of an authorship that's what i was getting at before is it's it was authored beforehand he wouldn't need to make a direct intervention it can't occur mm-hmm. otherwise well speaking so of authorship be, these the nature of these questions are poised to make it think like calvinists are the only ones with the issue whether you're a molinist no, I'm or, talking or about whatever Cal- between. that's what that's again i'm not i'm not bringing up anybody else i'm, I'm talking about what you guys have said so far that's all I'm talking about. Right. So I'm not being polemic. I'm, I'm not trying to say that Calvinists are <clears throat> unique to anything. I'm talking to you three gentlemen about what's unique to you and your <laughs> beliefs because you've been very articulate so far. So you, I'm not trying to bring in anybody else's opinions. Um, you, I, I'm you, just trying to get clarity from what you've said so far because you guys have been really, really good at this, uh, this whole like back and forth thing. But I feel like we've reached the real sticking point is that there seems to be um, something that's attached to the experience of human beings that is, as you said, uncoerced, unforced, um, but it seems to be isolated to our experience of the events because it's not independent of the decree. It is subsequent. Well, nothing's independent of God and his decree. Right, right. that's what I mean. But but here's the thing, you're you're just simply insisting with what I would take to be no justification that right. it's not freedom unless it's autonomy. And I, I, well, that's what I mean is I don't understand that. what you mean by freedom. By freedom, I well, mean there is nothing forcing them to do what their greatest desire is to do. Right. right. It, it seems that in your objection and in your definition of free, you are presupposing incompatibilism. And that's the reason why our explanations are not sticking, because you're 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 not using the definition of free will that I believe that. Well, of course, that that the three of us believe that scripture uses and and how the reformed exegetes have looked at it philosophically. 
incompatibilism in and of itself is automatically going to going to clash with anything that that tries to make uh, uh, God's decree and man's free free will compatible because it, it's for them by definition it's not. Mm. Can, right, can I, I read it? That's probably Josh. exactly what it is then, because yeah. I am I I I wouldn't necessarily agree that 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 actually amounts to something like freedom, except within the experience of the individual, um, and that's Josh. why I would call it an experiential will or an experiential agent rather than a free will at that point, because the the agent themselves is only experiencing what would be a free choice if it was disconnected from something that 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 uh, that rendered it immutable like you said it's not a causal thing that's why we're not that's why i just at, at the first just i said insisting you guys are material and autonomous it's not like there's just and we're not yeah, I was about to say there's just a conflation of free freedom yeah. and autonomy going on here. we're not going to concede so, that, that conflation i, I yeah. don't even think we need to go necessarily to to, to free and autonomous in this because autonomous is basically like it's 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 um you know own own law right it's like i can i can do what i want well don't right? commit the etymological fallacy though just because okay. autonomy comes from altos and namas doesn't mean that it means you know one's own law sure what we're saying what i think the rest of us are saying is that what josh davidson is doing is assuming uh, that it's only free if there is the metaphysical possibility of multiple outcomes yeah. And right. that those outcomes are determined solely or at least ultimately by the agent. And what we're saying is that, number one, we don't agree that freedom requires there be genuinely metaphysically multiple possibilities. And number two, that the agent is the ultimate one that determines which among competing possibilities to bring about. We're saying right. freedom means they do exactly what they want to do and they're not forced against their own will to do it. And so I don't I see any reason to not to... count that as freedom. It just it just needs to seem as though there could be the alternate possibility for it. Yeah, that's in, great. I like that. So here, yeah. let me give you an example, hmm. an analogy that a friend of mine once gave me, and, okay. and it's imperfect, like all. I'm, I'm really yeah. trying to follow what you're saying. You guys are being very clear with me right now, so I'm I'm very much trying. I understand. So so obviously, all all analogies are imperfect. But imagine that I was the um, the uh, the the person behind the counter at an ice cream shop and you came into my shop and I offered you what to you seemed to be two flavors of ice cream, chocolate and vanilla. And let's say that because of your prenatal development, your genetics, your upbringing, your life experiences, you love vanilla and you really detest chocolate. So you say, Chris, give me a scoop, you know, give me a three scoop cone of vanilla. And I hand you your vanilla cone, and then you say, now, can I at least just dip my finger into the chocolate, though, just to taste and remind myself of what I don't like? And lo and behold, you discover there actually wasn't any chocolate ice cream to begin with. What I'm, what I'm getting at here is that you thought you had the choice between vanilla and um, chocolate, and you chose what you wanted, even though the chocolate was never truly a metaphysically possible alternative. Yeah, I, I think a lot of what we run into with this is that we are really, truly trying to talk about things where we're interacting with God, who, you know, is beyond anything we can comprehend. And the way he interacts with creation, which we only have a limited understanding of from revelation in our experience. And right. all of the analogies that we have end up running into some kind of limitation, Right. So right. I, I think about like the analogy of like my son playing with his Legos, like that's an in, imperfect analogy because he's literally moving those Legos when the, so if one Lego, you know, pirate kills the other, like he's the one responsible for it because it's just matter. He, there's no will. There's nothing else involved. He's moving. Right. right. So that couldn't be a good analogy for what we're talking about, because we're actually talking about people that, that are more complex. The, the so, analogy of the playwright is an interesting one. But in essence, what it what it comes down to is almost like they have the lines they can say. The only things that they can do are like how well they do it or whether they screw it up. Right. right. Because the playwright says, here's your line. The person that's acting either says the line correctly or doesn't and says it with a certain amount of emotion or whatever. I feel like there's something in that analogy 
that doesn't quite map to our experience. That's why I was quick to, to distinguish that God as the ultimate playwright transcends. He's yeah, not yeah. limited to our system. So that which he um, decrees okay. or that which he writes in his script, the actors he's put in his play will not do such to um, to screw it up per se. The thing I wanted to say, though, what I was originally trying to say while Davidson and us were interacting is um, mm. not in response to what Davidson was saying, Josh Davidson, sorry, um, but that the nature of the question that was asked in the Q&A, um, I'm, I'm glad that you appealed to the fact that we're all trying to interact with God and explain something eternal. But what I was trying to say is this question is not just problematic for the Calvinist. It's it's problematic or it demands answer from the non-Calvinist groups mm -hmm. too. Because if you're an Arminian or a Molinist, God is still sovereignly choosing to do something. It's just with a different origin point of information. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I think we should probably end, end the conversation with, with just, I mean, something that, that Joshua S. said, that we're, we're diving into something that uh, in many ways we can't, we can't understand, but we won't get to the bottom of it mm -hmm. or, or, or even we see, we, we act like we see a contradiction to where the Bible doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to have that problem. For example, um, Joel Beakey says in, in his book, again, on the, on the same page, um, the Bible coordinates God's sovereign decree and responsible human agency. God decreed the details of Christ's suffering and death, yet the people involved acted freely, and they were accountable for their choices. Christ said, truly the Son of Man goes, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he's betrayed. Peter told his fellow Jews that Christ was handed over to crucifixion by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, yet said that you have crucified Christ, for which he urged them, repent and save yourselves from this wicked generation. Similarly, the Lord Jesus died necessarily by God's sovereign will, but also voluntarily by his own obedient will. Louis Burkhoff said, quote, there is not a single indication in scripture that the inspired writers are conscious of a contradiction in connection with these matters. They make no attempt to harmonize the two. This may well restrain us from assuming a contradiction here, even if we cannot reconcile both truths. You guys got anything else you want to add to that? I, think, I, yeah. I really appreciate everybody for their for their their respectful manners tonight and the and, and the clarity that you guys were able to, and I hope that Sherman and I were able to uh, bring bring out some things that that might be different than the the normal cycle of the conversation as it yeah. usually plays out and kind of get some of these other things out and i just really appreciate you guys right now yeah we got a couple more uh well we got a lot more q a questions but a lot of them have to you know do with the same thing so i'm kind of going through them but uh elizabeth asked she says i don't understand the difference between decreeing something permitting something and causing something any good sources or resources for understanding uh, Ooh, that's a good these question. concepts? That is a good question. Well, yeah, 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 you guys yeah. have any books or, or, or videos or podcasts to recommend uh, to get some of these people, some, 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 you know, long form answers to those things specifically. I think Guillaume Bignon's book, uh, excusing sinners, blaming God is a good book to help, uh, distinguish between what those three things mean. Okay. Um, and if people go to my the apologetics YouTube channel, they'll find a series that I did in which I, um, there were three episodes all having to do with the God as author analogy. And mm -hmm. in there I talk about, um, some of these concepts. And then one other video I'll suggest in that channel is a response that I did to Leighton flowers. Um, he had argued that we Cal should just embrace the robot and puppet analogies and i explain in there why robots and puppets aren't analogous to free agents in our view so those are the resources i'll suggest right and of, of course i would i would wholeheartedly agree with uh getting the book is excusing sinners and, and blaming god and i would also recommend the um i believe it was two streams that the author did uh with redeeming apologetics um, on the issue 
of this particular of this particular situation of determinism and things like that, responding to uh, objections by uh, the provisionists, Leighton Flowers, Tim Stratton, I believe, and and a few others. And, Are you and talking those about Eli really Ayala's revealed yes, apologetics? Yes, yes, Eli's okay. mm-hmm. revealed apologetics. Yeah, Guillaume revealed Guillaume. apologetics. Fact, was that just yesterday that he was on his show, or is that right he was. now? Okay, he was. Right, so he um he recently um. I think it was he did a commentary on the debate that um, that James White and uh, William Lane Craig did. And of course, he also had James White on to do a review of that himself. So (laughs) getting getting that channel into your feed is really good. I would highly recommend it. And also to throw this out there, uh, Tyler and I had a discussion uh, uh, a lengthy discussion with J.D. Martin about this exact same thing, who takes a completely different approach than you gentlemen, uh, right. and, and uh, rather starkly so uh, after having this conversation. Um, and so I, 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 I kind of, I kind of like the, 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 the title of that that it was excusing sinners and blaming God. So that's that's what he that's that's obviously a charge against people like like the Joshes here. Uh, thinking that the the freedom needs to be a specific way, and then kind of addressing that question as far as like not permission and decree, but like not causing something directly by decreeing it. Am I still yeah. following? Yeah, he's 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 rebutting the objection to his own determinism, his own compatibilism, his own Calvinism. The objection that says you Calvinists are 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 uh, setting up a reality or, def- or or saying that reality is such that sinners can be excused for their sins and God can be blamed for it. He's he's rebutting that objection. That's why it's called excusing sinners blaming God. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. That's a really interesting title. I have to say that that's a that's a like a very attention grabbing yeah. title. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Oh, so is there any more questions there, Tyler? Yeah, yeah, we actually got one for you, bro, from Miguel. He says, uh, question for Joshua. Could we say that there is no way of avoiding sin besides having a risen body and hence sin will happen? So God decrees it for his own glory in the favor of his elect. I, I'm not I, sure. What, like, what's the... I don't understand. Yeah, I don't... Could Jesus. we say that there is no way of avoiding sin besides having a risen body, and hence sin will happen, so Jesus God had, decrees it? Jesus did own... not have a risen body before he died, and he did not sin, and he wouldn't yeah. have sinned even if he'd never died. So I don't think... I would not affirm this. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm not. I'm not sure I understand it fully, but... Uh, God decrees it for his own glory in the favor of his elect. So I, I, I think what he's trying to say is that um, it, like it's, it's inevitable that we would have sinned anyway, even if we were free, something like that. It, like if, I, if I'm trying to piece that together and that God decreed this to be the outworking of it, to be something that brings glory to himself and favor to those who love him, something like that. Yeah, maybe, that's kind of... maybe that's what he means. I, I might be misunderstanding. I'm sorry. I, I'm no, that's kind of the way I'm making it out too, Miguel. Mm-hmm. If you're still watching, brother, feel, feel free to clarify if we uh, if we missed it. But Jordan uh, Th- uh, Thornburg had a really good question. He says, "Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Does God determine the desire upon we upon which we must act? How would you so guys I, answer that?" I think that was I answered. Well, I never, there's this, Jordan kept asking in the chat, "Who causes them to sin? Who causes them to sin?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. They mm-hmm. cause them to sin. They choose to sin. It's their will that causes right. them to sin. But mm-hmm. number one, their will is influenced by all sorts of factors, including their genetics, their prenatal development, their upbringing, their life experiences, their addictions, everything, their friends, their relationships, all of that influence the will, including their own desire. And the result of all that influence is that the will just choose it makes a choice but that number two that choice has been predetermined by god so this the pro the whole problem with jordan's question is his his is his keep he's got he keeps saying what causes them to sin they do they cause themselves right. to sin their right. will does it's kind of that going back to that assuming incompatible incompatibilism right yeah. that's gotcha gotcha jeremiah andrew you guys want to jump on that too or no, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, Tertullian said, as I read, you know, our desires and our choices spawn 
uh, they they come spontaneously from us. Right. So the 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 blame cannot go to God. It can it comes from us. Right. And that's kind it's of it's funny the thing. because yeah, Sam, Sam is even continuing it. Who causes their will to cause them right. to sin? They cause them to they sin. Do. They cause their will to I, sin. I They're think that choosing. largely stems from the fact that these other people are having the same disconnect that that mm -hmm. uh, Jeremiah described for myself. Is that yeah? The mm -hmm. baseline assumption here is that a uh, either it is compatible that God d exhaustively uh, authored or decreed all things that would come to pass. And also these people are free to act in a correspondence with their own desires and be the cause of their own choices. Just not the, uh, what did you call it? Primary first? What, how did Ultimate you? Primary first cause. Yeah. Yeah. First cause. Okay. Without being the first cause of the thing. I think the disconnect is that if there is a first cause and it's not the individual agent, that the freedom is then compromised. I think that's where these people are coming from. Well, that's mm -hmm. the assumption. That's the indeterminist assumption. Right. And well, I think that's, we, but that's what I mean is that I think the, the opposite assumption is what, because I, I think we're both making an assumption to build the case from both ends. Our, well, I, I don't agree. What we are choosing not to assume that um, freedom is compromised if the choice doesn't ultimately originate with the agent, whereas the indeterminist is assuming that it is compromised in that event. Mm -hmm. right. so and we, and we, we see that I'm not assuming the... that it isn't. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I feel like that's a semantic difference. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, to make, I, I think that, I think that what we're saying here is that there's a, there's a, an axiom difference, right? Like we're starting from different points yes. and then reaching different conclusions because of the different starting points. And I think that's why the word cause is coming out in it. It's not necessarily an attempt to be fallacious. It's literally just missing it. Mm -hmm. I know you're not trying to be fallacious and it's of course possible that you're not being fallacious to begin with and I'm just playing semantic games. That's all possible. All I'm saying is I come to the issue of freedom and I try to make no assumptions about what that requires. And one of the assumptions I refuse to make is that in order for an agent's choice to be free, their choice has to ultimately full stop originate with them. I see no reason to grant that and so I refuse to accept that assumption. And so lacking that assumption i come to scripture like genesis 50 20 and i see god making a choice that his that joseph's brothers would sell him into slavery and then i see joseph's brothers choosing to sell him into slavery i see yeah. joseph attributing that choice equally to both of those parties mm -hmm. and yet god holds the his brothers accountable and so what i'm forced to conclude is that yeah freedom isn't compromised if it doesn't originate ultimately with the agent as long right. as they're not being forced to do what they do. And it kind of goes back to, you know, Isaiah 10 gets brought up a lot in these discussions. Why does God punish Assyria? Is because of their heart. They had a wicked heart, and that's the, the reason. God used them to accomplish a purpose with Israel. He punishes them because of their, their pride and their arrogance, right, the king. And so it works both ways. So I get exactly what you guys are coming from. I mean, to assume you know, incompatibility, I think that is leading to a lot of these assumptions. Am I right? Yeah. Would you guys agree with that? God yeah. determines and, all and, things, but he does it in such a manner that you will freely choose to do so. Mm -hmm. right. and, and, and again, in relation to the <laughs> assumptions, I don't want, when we say the assumptions and presuppositions, we're not saying that you are actively presupposing this. And in and, and many ways, our presuppositions are are hidden to us. They're caught but rather the, than the, taught sometimes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not, and, and, I'm, I'm, I'll own that I'm presupposing that. I, like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'll own that. I am, I am presupposing that, that yeah. in fact, genuine freedom is something that amounts to being the first cause within the cause, like within the, the choice itself, the, the, the chooser is the the determiner not the de the decree is not determining what choice that i'll make so, in, in the same sense as an author would would write exhaustively the story and then take place in the story that's what i mean is i think that's the disconnect that i'm having and you guys have brought yeah. a lot of clarity using that analogy for me to understand why you think that 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 the the word cause is the wrong word like, I understand now why you would say the word cause is the wrong word. 
because it's mm-hmm. actually an interactive word in a different way than decree in the way that you're using that. So I now understand right. yeah. because of that, <clears throat> that explanation, why the word causes is the wrong word. That's why I was saying for the people who are in the comments, who are leaving the, the questions that the word cause is not going to get the, the answer that you're, that you're asking for because it's the wrong word. So I, I think maybe the, there's kind of two ways to look at, the, at this conversation, right? The, the first is, is asking the question about whether we have gotten to a point where maybe we have a more consistent idea about what you, uh, three, four gentlemen that are Calvinists believe, how that fits together, how that's a worldview that, that you know, is generally consistent with itself or not like those, I feel like we're getting a sense of like, okay, a lot of the inconsistencies maybe that we're seeing with, with Calvinism in the wild, maybe what we're seeing is inconsistency with different people believing slightly different versions of things and trying to understand that. So I think we've added a lot of clarity to maybe just a, a better, maybe self-contained, more consistent system. The question then becomes kind of the meta question of, okay, but between that and a competing system of looking at these things, which one is fits better with scripture and or with our experience of reality? I think that's going to have to be a question that we table for for another day because we're, we're, right. we're at time and and kind of pushing the, that boundary as we keep running into this language of cause and cause and cause. Um, right. I will just say, you know, obviously, I do think that there there is, um, you know, there there isn't a, a different view um, and that I happen to hold to that view. And and that's great. You know, I think we can we can talk about that uh, at length as, as we dive into things more maybe in a subsequent episode right on right on let me ask you uh, just sherman and davidson real quick if there was one more thing that you could ask these guys before we get off and then i want to get chris jeremiah and andrew's just closing thoughts what would that question be we're at that point um but yeah we'll start with sherman what would that question be Oof. um the one thing that comes to mind for me is is thinking about um Genesis 50, 20, and, and looking at that, um, I think sometimes what we, what I've tended to see is that people will approach that and they'll look at that verse and just say, okay, let's look at that verse. Let's dive into the grammar. Let's get so deep on it that we know exactly what it says. And they kind of forget that he's looking back on narrative we actually have in Genesis 37, I think it's 37, of like the what actually happened and kind of how that played out. And so I think it would be interesting to dive into that a little bit more and just kind of look at that and say, you know, it looks like what's happening is, you know, God is giving Joseph a dream, right? And Joseph responds the way that he he does, being his personality, he tells his brothers. And and playing that out a little bit more, because I think maybe there's a little bit more we could see if we look into some of those details around how this plays out in kind of flesh and blood uh, and, and not just kind of theory uh, that might be interesting. But so it's not really a question, but just kind of an observation, I guess, for me. Well, you've made you've observed a perfect example of the secondary causes that we've been talking about, right? That dream that God gives Joseph, that Joseph then, like a impotent, or I mean, not impotent, a petulant child, goes and brags to his his siblings and parents, "Hey, you're all going to bow down to me," and that causes them to get all riled up and angry, and then sell him into slavery. All those things are among mm-hmm. those secondary causes that God determines in order to bring about the uh, the actions of Joseph's brothers that he decrees. And just to add to that real quick, Chris, there are so many variables that go into just one decision. Think about the billions and trillions and just un- innumerable amounts of decisions moment by moment that everyone in this world, you know, that does it's just it's it's mind-blowing it's absolutely staggering uh davison let's get your last thoughts brother anything uh that you wanted to run by these guys uh as we wind down um anything that i would ask at this point would probably end up being cyclical so um (laughs) i'll just i'll just again extend you guys my thanks and my my i've got a bail because uh sherman see you brother all right thanks thanks for hanging out bud for real um, but I, I really respect all you guys. Um, I, I expect um, that, you know, hopefully I wasn't, you know, at any point disrespectful or inflammatory. I was really trying my hardest not, not to be all. objectionable, uh, but just to ask questions. Um, and I feel like you guys were really uh, very prepared to answer the questions in a really well formatted way. Um, I can't say that I was necessarily convinced, but I didn't expect to be. Um, I, you know, I. I, I'll admit that I have my biases, that I came from a position very similar to you guys. 
I hadn't necessarily heard it articulated in the way that you did with the authorship analogy to Tolkien and then creating the degree of separation, let's say causally, and then saying cause is the wrong word, drawing these really specific distinctions, I think is really useful. Um, and, and I don't necessarily want to like rehash the same questions, but I really appreciate the approach that you guys have taken. Uh, Andrew, don't discredit yourself. You're very intelligent. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but to, to the other two guys here, I really appreciate you because there's a lot of other things you could be doing and that you guys uh, freely chose to join us here and participate <laughs> in this. And I thank we did, you very much and we for were that. decreed to do so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And gentlemen, I, I just want to, ex again, extend from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Chris, love to have you back on every time. It's, a, it's an amazing conversation with you, bro. Jeremiah, I love you, man. I'm gl so glad that Andrew introduced us. We're going to have to do more together. And Andrew, brother, you know it, man. You're always welcome on CSG, and we're going to have to talk a lot more, bro. But you guys, I really, really appreciate this. Any closing thoughts um, just for kind of we've got, you know, some a uh, little bit of like layback in the uh, in the comments uh, with people. But if there's anything that you could tell our listeners just winding down, Chris, we'll start with you. What would that be? <clears throat> Um, I want to encourage my fellow Calvinists to think of, like I said earlier, think of the relationship between God and time as something analogous to the relationship between an author and the story, because I think that non-Calvinists are right to object if there is a meaningful sense in which God is causing people to sin. Um... And so, as far as I can tell, this transcendence gap relationship between an author and a story or what that's analogous to, which is God and creation, I think that's critical for maintaining um, moral culpability for humans. And so, I want to encourage Calvinists to think more along those lines. But at the same time, I want to encourage non-Calvinists to stop to, to stop using the puppet and robot crap because that is there's no no calvinist has a view in which human beings are analogous to puppets and robots for the reasons that i explained i want to encourage not critics of calvinism I think you will most meaningfully interact with our view if the analogy you interact with is the analogy of an author in a story. Um, because then I think you get you, you have agents who are choosing to do what they do, but who have been decreed by the author to do what they do. And if that proves to still leave them either morally unaccountable, uh, unable to be held accountable, or if it makes God morally culpable... Well, then that analogy, then then I would probably no longer be a determinist, because at that point, I, I don't know how I can affirm human culpability and, and deny that God is a culpable for it. So my hope um, and my suspicion is that both sides of the debate need to move more toward conceiving of Calvinistic determinism as this an author story analogy and let the battle so to speak, happen on that ground, on that terrain. Um, and I think that is the most fruitful way of moving the conversation forward. I think a lot more ground would be covered if we did start doing it, viewing it from that story uh, perspective. I agree, I I agree so 100%. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, what's the closing thoughts, brother? Well, really, and I would I would like to resonate with with Chris, you know, we we need to frame the Calvinistic and, and, and non-Calvinistic debate uh, in, in more concrete terms and in more representative terms, because in many ways, the Calvinists, uh, not necessarily the Calvinists, the non-Calvinists often, often in my experience, do not represent the, uh, the Calvinist position well, because from, from my experience in debating, in order for your opponent to even have a sufficient dialogue with you, you must be able to s represent your opponent's position so well that they can see themselves in your representation or else you're not going to get anywhere. If, if you're just going to say, well, you believe this, 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 and this, and they say, no, I don't. And the only thing yeah. you say is, yes, you do. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere. The only thing you're going to do is simply reaffirm your bias. If we're going to have, if we're going to continue this conversation and continue the conversation as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to have to do that first. Hmm. Well, I hope we were able and to facilitate something like that here. 
You oh, did. we have. Oh, we really oh, have. Oh. I am. I am so refreshed by the discussion that we've had here and the discussion that Andrew and I had a few days ago with uh, a TikToker, TikToker Crazy God story. Mm-hmm. That was such a a refreshing. Um, a refreshing discussion from the the usual uh, war path that we have right. in our circles. Right. So I, I I can't thank you guys enough for that. And 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 Andrew, it's always a pleasure to uh, to partner you, with you in these things. Chris, Absolutely. it is a complete yeah. honor. I tip my hat to you. And um, I mean, I just wish I could I could uh, come up to your to your scruples in relation to uh, to these subjects and others. If you're not up there yet, you will be. I'm not that high. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I don't Andrew. put on a good show. I'm not yeah, yeah. as smart as I think as I make it seem I am. Man, y'all cut yourself short, man. Y'all are very <laughs> intelligent, very intelligent, and very articulate, and really appreciate it. Andrew, take us out, brother. What do you think? Closing thoughts for the people, for the listeners. Well, as the baby Calvinist, um, more than honored. I think I'm actually receiving the uh, the larger end of the stick, being able to absorb. Chris, you really challenged me. You know, um, Jeremiah and even you now, Tyler, will um, will agree when I say that there's such a polemic on social media, but especially TikTok against Calvinism. There are people that are outspoken that we are heretics. We don't belong to the body of Christ. And yep. more than coming to the defense of saying, no, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, um, this is what Calvinism actually represents. We have to internally unite on what terms we're going to use to best reflect what we actually believe. So from the bottom of our heart, we are looking for more of these opportunities to have um, in the midst of people who disagree with us, you know, just very productive conversation that even if you don't walk away agreeing with our position, that's really not Jeremiah and I's uh, ultimate goal. I think it, I think it would make you more consistent in your hermeneutic and your exegesis. But even if you walk away saying you disagree, what Chris was saying, that you can at least steel man our position and say, I know why I disagree with them, but I still consider them brothers and sisters in Christ. They don't do anything damning to the gospel or to the triune God. And that's ultimately ultimately where my heart is, is we want to unite. But when people ignorantly turn a secondary cause into something that's prime, they think Calvinism's primary to the gospel, that we have another gospel, um, we really need to open the floor um, to to really set the record straight so that people could be educated and walk away with a renewed sense of unity in the body of Christ. And so I'm, I'm right. always thankful for that opportunity. And I promise if we make this into an annual thing, um, by the time we do this next year, I'll be at least a third as smart as Jeremiah. How does that sound? <laughs> Boy, you better we'll stop. Make it happen. <laughs> we'll I got to read happen. some books. And I thank right. you for the recommendations, too. Yeah, absolutely, man. And no, just to just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, Andrew, putting stones in people's shoes, even if at the end of the day, we walk away disagreeing, right? We can still get together. It's proven right here on CSG that Calvinists and non-Calvinists can get together, have a really good two, almost two hour conversation and not get into a fight, not get into a knockout drag out, you know, and it. It Nobody just pulled so... out the H word. Nobody. Mm, <laughs> look, right. it, well, it's because David Russell wasn't here. So, you know, it, <laughs> it's going to happen there. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, now he's going to have to make a response video <laughs> to bomb you. Oh, uh, you know, it, it was already coming, bro. That's predestined. I'll go ahead and call that one. <laughs> but uh, thank you, gentlemen. We will uh, actually, CSG, um, Friday night, we have an amazing show lined up with the faithiest atheist, Richard Suttles, to discuss something Greg Kokel actually said on Capturing Christianity capturing christianity um posed a question and so we're going to bring richard on to uh discuss that on csg friday night uh seven o'clock so look out for that and gentlemen again it's been an honor it's been fun and i have had a blast thank you all so much for joining us go to completecenters.com for more and we will see y'all next time good night god bless and we will see you soon